Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good in the middle of the night for everyone, depending on wherever you are. Welcome to this uh, session for the Environmental Physiotherapy Agenda 2023. This is one of our quarterly uh, working group meetings, but it's also actually uh, timed conveniently to, to equally represent uh, one of the Environmental Physiotherapy Association roundtables. Uh, we're recording also this meeting for YouTube. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited about this meeting because of the, the topic and the people we have here that will present. Um, the Environmental Physiotherapy Agenda 2023 is uh, our international education project that at the moment uh, um, well brings together over 60 universities from around the world, uh, over 30 supporting organizations, et cetera, et cetera, that are looking at uh, integrating planetary health, environmental and sustainability education into physiotherapy training around the world. And so as we're looking at uh, loads of different ways and questions, you know, competencies, learning outcomes, content, uh, teaching approaches, et cetera, to all of this, uh, a really important element of uh, every undergraduate or pre-registration uh, uh, physiotherapy program uh, is, is also the student research project. And um, for me, it kind of it became really clear quite a while ago, you know, that number one, physio physiotherapy students, generally speaking, are really excited about this topic uh, on the whole. Uh, they really want to get involved here. And then student research projects just have a huge potential of uh, for, for all of us, really, you know, for it's, it's, they have a huge potential for the, the students learning, but also all of our learning and for our kind of growing understanding of this really new field and new engagement. And so, yeah, it's with great pleasure that we have uh, five students with us here today in this first session and another six students uh, with us in the later session today that will present their research. Uh, uh, most of the research is at very different stages. Some are, bachelor, you know, the majority are, I would say, bachelor's projects. Uh, some are already done. Some are in the very beginnings. Some are um, at the at kind of, yeah, later stages. Um, but irrespective of stage, I think it's really interesting to see just how broad the possibilities are, generally speaking, in research in this area. And, um, and uh, it's just wonderful to see how students are taking to this and, uh, and um, producing some really uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff for all, that's really relevant for all of us. So without further ado, I've told the, our presenters that we're going to be very strict with time. Our meeting is going to go a little bit over an hour, I think, today. Um, we would also, so we, we will have 10 minute presentations from everyone, potentially nine minute and 30 second long presentations, just to make sure. Uh, and we'll have very short Q&A sessions in between and for the listeners and also the other presenters, it'd be lovely if you could prepare your questions along the way so that we don't have too long sort of silences uh, in between the presentations. Um, and uh, we'll keep those Q and A sessions relatively short as well, two to three minutes. I'm guessing about I don't know one, two, a maximum of three questions maybe, and then we'll move on to the next presentations. And um, just a reminder also that this meeting will be recorded for posterity for YouTube, the EPA YouTube channel, where we can then kind of review the presentations. Mm, and um, just uh, yep. I think that's it. Um, I will make sure, I hope everyone can kind of stay muted all the time uh, if you're not presenting at least. And uh, if anything technical comes up, I think that's just to be expected with these meetings and we've all come to uh, appreciate these technical difficulties in Zoom meetings and the likes that uh, we know well enough how to deal with it. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to our first presenter. Uh, and that is uh, Ms. Mila Plaison, Plaison, I'm not sure actually of the last name, I'm going to pronounce it in French. She has done her bachelor's uh, degree at uh, HFU Furtwang University in Germany uh, uh, with a specific focus on uh, discourse analysis of the concept of sustainability in physiotherapy. So I'm um, just going to remove my spotlight here and over to you, Mila. Okay, thank you, Philip. I will share my screen. Okay, yeah, 
So today I will present my discourse analysis of the concept of sustainability in physiotherapy, which was my bachelor thesis. And uh, yeah, first of all, why do I care about sustainability? Um, on this picture, you can see a beautiful island called Halig Lange. Um, and I worked there for a year um, on this Halig in nature conservation. And environmental issues on this island is not a question of quality, um, but a question of survival. And this year left its mark on me and nature there has never let go of me until today. Um, in the next picture, um, you can see the organization Health for Future, uh, which is mainly placed in Germany. And they draw attention to the connection between climate change and health. And in the photo, you can see us at a vigil in Freiburg during the election time. So I wanted to do um, yeah, a more activist bachelor thesis or also yeah, combining my concerns um, with my bachelor thesis and this is my structure. So I will give you first um, a shortly background in the theory. What is sustainability? Um, sustainability development, um, like the, the most, oh, sorry, um, the most famous definition of that is from the Brundtland report and they say that sustainable, sustainable development is um, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And in literature they often talk about social, economy, economic and environmental goals and the necessity of integrating and balancing those goals with each other. Um, there are different models um, of the sustainability. Because of time, I will mainly focus on those two concentric models in the middle, because I think this is most interesting. Um, in contrast to the other models, um, this model is focusing on the environment. As you can see, the outer layer consists um, of the environment. And the argumentation behind that is that um, the researchers said, um, well, our economy and our society is relying on a functioning environment. And if the environment is not functioning anymore, also our economy and our society can't exist. So this is um, yeah, a prioritization, prior, prioritization there. And um, on the right side, you can see that the economy is um, only shown in dashed lines because they say economy is actually just a product of society. Um, Various approaches are describing are described in the discourse on sustainability. Um, so here you can see the anthropocentrism and the ecocentri ecocentrism. Um, the anthropocentrism is shown in the uh, left picture. Um, <clears throat> and so we, um, yeah, anthropocentrism thinks more from the perspective we humans and our special position in the environment. And accordingly, it is also predominantly about human values. So we are in the center of the perspective. On the right side, you can see the ecocentrism approach. Um, this ascribes its own values to nature, yet it is all about us. So we are part of the nature and it is not separated. Um, you can also find very often the um, description of a strong sustainability approach and a weak sustainability approach. So um, the weaker approach sees the achievement of sustainability goals as given if economic growth continues to be promoted. And the weaker approach sees growth and technology as critical to achieving social and environmental goals and suggests to stop the growth paradigm. Therefore the snail. And um, yeah, the different perspectives also lead to contradiction and the prioritization of sustainable goals. While the weaker approach prioritizes the economy, um, the stronger approach prioritizes um, the environment. And growth and development therapy reinforce the environmental and social problems. So the two approaches therefore lead to different results. 
Um, in addition, there has been a global inequitable distribution between those who profit from growth and those who pay it for it with social and ecological capital. So that is why there's also a lot of criticism of the term sustainability itself and problems arising from diversity are described as contradiction and bias, um, frustration. It remains a phenomenon of responsibility. Um, the sustainability debate is also dominated by colonial thinking. And um, yeah, most of the time on an anthropocentric and economic perspective. And not involved in the sustainability debate are, for example, indigenous people, low-income countries, and non-expert voices in the health sector, such as patients. Um, in my critical discourse analysis, I was um, looking for three articles which are very different in their approaches to see to like, show how yeah variable the term sustainability is understood. And um, yeah, I asked myself, what is the current understanding of sustainable development and physiotherapy science? So the first article focused on ecology and is more representing a stronger sustainability approach. Article B also focused on ecology, but is representing a weaker approach. And Article C focused mainly on economy and environmental um, goals are not mentioned at all, but all of these three articles use the word sustainability. So I had a tough time to <laughs> shorten my results, uh, but I focused on the three discourse trends. And um, because um, this shows a little bit also the differences between this argumentation of those articles. Um, so I found they have different assumptions and beliefs. Um, Article A um, believes that we as physios have a responsibility to the environment and um, emphasizes this understanding as an ethical value. And Article B emphasizes more the co-benefits of climate change mitigation, as it is also about protecting our health. And Article C is talking about economic advantages instead of environmental protection. And a benefit analysis over a long period of time is therefore considered as sustainable. The next trend of discourses are about different representations of the problem and solution approaches. So Article A sees the problem as people exploiting our ecosystem. And to find a solution, Article A calls for networking, learning, and action to create environmental responsibility. In Article B, the ecological tipping points are presented as problematic because they have an impact on health. And therefore, science assessment and calculations are needed to prevent environmental and health crisis. Um, fundamental to this is the belief that assessments and calculations can be used to study and control pollution and exploitation by us humans. In Article C, they believe in the benefits of so-called specific robot-assisted therapy. And um, yeah, the solution is that we need more benefit analysis of health technologies in order to um, be more, yeah, to have better finances in hospitals. Mila, just a heads up that you're about one and a half minutes away from time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, to link the strengths briefly, um, the strengths of discourses to the theory mentioned at the beginning, it can be argued that Article A argues mainly from an um, anthropocentric motivation, as, and Article B as well as environmental protection is about health protection. However, Article A also has an ecocentric approach as it emphasizes that humans have an ethical responsibility to nature and other species regardless of, their, of the benefits from that. Um, while Article A aims then more for an integrative approach, Article B focuses mainly on measuring and controlling the carbon footprint. And Article C, on the other hand, does not see sustainability as linked to the environment at all, but more to economic progress through technical innovative solutions. Um, yeah, as power structures, the growth paradigm of the health sector can be found, especially in Articles C and B. And humans take more a controlling center uh, rule towards the climate or environment. 
in Article B. And a limitation during my research was also that the predominant representation of discourses were voices from high income countries. Um, so my conclusion is that the term sustainability and physiotherapy is not clear. Um, there is a need, I would say it's um, better or clearer if we would pronounce it more specifically, for example, we could call it a physiotherapeutic environmental awareness and corresponding more specific term terminology for environmental and social uh, goals. It is through language that marginalized issues issues can be re-emerged, and I think there is a need to catch up in addressing the aspect of environmental and social sustainability in physiotherapy science. So, yeah, what could physiotherapists do? Um, I, yeah, we could think about how we tell stories um, about sustainability, how we want to talk about it, because that shapes our perspectives on the world and also others. So, yeah confrontation and taking responsibility until it is taken for granted. And um, yeah, last but not least, my favorite quote, as long as there is imagined, there is hope. Um, be critical and try to imagine our world and physiotherapy in different ways, even that might be uncomfortable for others or yourself. And thank you for your attention. Sorry for going over the time. <laughs> thank you, Mila, uh, for your lovely presentation and thanks for keeping to time. Um, I'll, I'll relay a question to you from uh, Saravana Kuma that was added here in the chat. And uh, Saravana is asking, uh, is for, uh, just saying, Mila, thank you for your presentation. Did you expect to find so few articles exploring sustainability in physiotherapy? Is it due to lack of awareness or something else? So basically asking, you know, were you surprised that there is only so little or is there only so little maybe is also something you would want to answer. Uh, and just before you do that, also remember to unshare your screen. Ah, thank you. Um, okay. I did unshare my screen. No problem. Mm -hmm. We'll just, we'll work it out when the next person tries to share or something. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for this question. Um, I think... I was surprised that in general, there was a lot already about the connection between climate change and health, but very little in physiotherapy science and also quite often not really about the environment. Um, but that was not really surprising because I already expected that. Um, yeah. Um, is that an answer? I think an important answer also to that, Mila, just because I know a little bit about your study as well, is that, you know, we have to remember it's kind of, it's, a, uh, you, you've, it, it's a, you know, the size of your study is also a limiting factor. You know, you've done a bachelor study and not a master's or a PhD. And so you were only able to include a few articles of the ones that are out there. But as far yeah. as I recall, you tried to pick a few that were representative of the main types of publications that we're seeing in physiotherapy. And to be fair, there isn't that many more. Uh, you know, there there is a few more, but not a huge amount. Uh, that anyway, that explicitly use the word uh, sustainability or try to address sustainability in some way. I guess it's there's more and more coming now. But I think you kind of laid that foundation and looking at a few that were quite representative and just showing you know what they talk about when they talk about um, yeah. uh, uh, sustainability. I think that's an important element. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there are a few more articles I would like to have yeah. included. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think most of them are from Philip. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think some <clears throat> of these articles were also very interesting because they talked about environmental responsibility and protection in physiotherapy, but they didn't use the word sustainability. That was also interesting. Yes, yeah, good point. Um, all right, we have also a comment from Rose Buko from uh, Australia. Uh, just a comment, really enjoyed your presentation, Mila, highlighting that I could review articles differently. It really opened my eyes. Thank you from uh, Rose. And thanks from me as well, Mila. That was really lovely. I'm not sure what's happening with the screen share. Fingers uh, crossed. I stopped it. Yeah, but yeah. I don't know I can... what's going on there. Um, well, let's just see if Linya can share her yeah. presentation and okay. if that will override yours. Okay. Uh, but thank you for that. And then uh, we're moving on to Linya Chi from the University of South Australia. Oh, now the presentation is gone. 
Um, and uh, Linia, I hope you can hear me and know that you're next now. Linia will be presenting uh, on an honors project that is exploring Australian physiotherapists' views on and views and practice about climate change and its effects on health. Uh, really looking forward to this. Let's go. Can anyone um, see my screen? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Thanks, Philly, really for the opportunity to present my research project today. So I'm going to showcase to you the body, body of work that myself and my supervisors who are listed in this slide have been doing in the past couple of years, looking at the role of physiotherapist and climate change. So as you know, um, I am based in Australia, and which is an island in the Southern Hemisphere. And I'm talking to you from the city of churches called Adelaide. So Adelaide is the home of the Ghana people who are the traditional owner of this land. And I want to acknowledge them and respect their elders past, present and emerging. Now, as many of you may be familiar with Australia associated with koala and kangaroo, However, in the um, last few years, extreme weather events are becoming more and more common in Australia, such as bushfires and floods, which have adversely impacted on our national animals' health as well as human health. So as a result, um, we have been doing some work by looking at what role physiotherapists can play in addressing this climate change. So the first part of this work um, we started about two years ago that I was fortunate to be awarded a vacation research scholarship from my university, and um, which allowed me to do a scoping review of literature about environmental physiotherapy. And the aim of this scoping review is to identify and map the literature reporting on the relationship between physiotherapy and environmental health. So um, currently, um, this research is in the screening stage, but the key finding we have already identified is there is no research that has particularly focused on Australian physiotherapist views about climate change. However, we did identify three surveys which have explored other health professionals' views and practice about climate change. So the first survey called um, American Thoracic Survey, which has involved international physicians as their participants. Um, and we also chose this survey to form the base of our second part of research work, which I will tell you later soon. And the second survey called um, Multinational Survey. So this survey has looked at not only international physicians, but also um, nurses and midwives, public health professionals and mental health care professionals about their views about climate change. And there's only one Australian-based survey, which has done by Climate and Health Alliance. And this survey has explored um, Australian nurses and midwives, physicians and public health professionals and other health professionals views about climate change. And the common finding from these three surveys is um, most participants agree that health professionals do have a role in climate change mitigation. And I also aware that there has been a recent South African survey of physiotherapists on this topic, but it was published after we completed our um, literature review, so we didn't include it here. So as all of us know that physiotherapists do have a role to play in climate change. And as I mentioned before, um, there's no research that has particularly focused on Australian physiotherapists. Therefore, there's a knowledge gap that needs to be um, potentially addressed. So therefore, my second part of research work is going to be a quantitative cross-sectional survey study by looking at Aust Australian physiotherapists. Therefore, the aim of my uh, survey study is to investigate Australian physiotherapist views and current practices in relation to climate change and its impacts on health. Um, and we already have gained ethics approval from our university. 
So there are two phases in my survey study, and I've completed the first phase, which uh, was about the survey development and testing the survey instrument. And the survey study is now in um, phase two, which is about actual survey distribution. But let's start with phase one first. So as I mentioned, the ATS, uh, the ATS survey forms the base of our risk, uh, survey study because its aim best aligns with our study aim. And I have modified some of the questions from the ATS survey um, to make it more suitable for our participants. So firstly, we converted the American spelling to Australian spelling. Um, and secondly, we modify questions to suit our target audience because the ATS survey um, was specific for physicians. Um, we changed it to physiotherapists. And thirdly, we also um, contextualize some of conditions in the ATS survey to make it more Australia of context. And we are also looking for different demographic things such as gender and um, for more information, you can see the table in the right side of this slide about the demographic things. And because we have made some, um, we have changed some elements of the survey instrument, um, we then piloted to a physios um, for the usability of the survey instrument. So this a physios um, came from diverse clinic backgrounds and diverse uh, personal backgrounds in terms of their language and culture. And according to their feedback, we made some minor changes to the survey instrument. Um, and we also got their feedback about the time to of the survey, um, which is about 10 minutes in average. So now we are in phase two, which is about the actual survey um, administration and data collection and analysis. So as we know, there are nearly 38,000 registered physiotherapists in Australia currently. Um, based on the sample size calculation, um, we need approximately 385 participants in order for us to get the representative sample. And about who we are interested, so we are interested in any registered Australian physiotherapists who are currently working. And as I mentioned, we are now um, the survey study is now in recruitment stage. So we are mainly re recruiting participants from two ways. So the first way is through Australian Physiotherapy Association, APA. So APA is the National Physiotherapy Association, which has a quite large pool of Australian registered physiotherapists. And they already published our survey information in their November newsletter. And to increase the response rate, uh, we also use the social media to promote our survey. So I already created a Facebook page, which is specifically dedicated to this survey study, which you can see the Facebook uh, page screenshot in the right-hand side here. And the link has been shared by all my supervisors through their professional networks, such as Twitter and LinkedIn, just to recruit as much uh, as many participants as possible. And we are collecting data through SurveyMonkey, which is an online survey platform, and it is an anonymous survey, and the link will um, remain open up to six weeks and we are going to pro regularly promote it um, through the social network. Just make sure people can see it and get access to it. And now I, I'd like to share some preliminary um, findings about responses to date. So we have got 22 responses so far with the general agreement that climate change is happening and it is relevant to physiotherapy patient care. So thank you everyone for listening and thanks Philip again for pro providing me this opportunity. I look forward to contributing to this more in the future. And if any of you are an Australian physiotherapist who are interested in my survey, it is still open now and you can feel free to scan this QR code to get access to it. Otherwise, any questions for me? Thank you.
Thanks, Linia. Uh, um, that was really lovely and uh, and impressive in in all sorts of different ways. Um, uh, so I'm open. We're open for questions. If you could kind of raise your hand, then I can uh, just uh, identify that. But otherwise, I actually also have uh, two thoughts. Number one is, uh, Linia. I don't know if we have done this before, but if we haven't, uh, let's just very quickly uh, post an EPA blog post and share your survey information through the EPA. Um, you know. Uh, channels as well. I think we can maybe reach a few more people in Australia that way as well that maybe haven't thought of it otherwise. I have one question myself, and that is that I, I am aware of the fact that the Australian Physiotherapy Association is actually a member in the Climate and Health Alliance that has uh, kind of that is the essentially publisher behind one of the art, uh, kind of survey studies that you mentioned at the beginning. That's the mm -hmm. Real Real Urgent and Now uh, publication, yes. I think. Yeah. I'm wondering of the extent, I don't know, this is maybe not something that you know, but I'm wondering of the extent to which the 30,000 members of the APA are aware that in a way the, the question of whether or not climate change is relevant to physiotherapists has been kind of answered in a top-down manner in the sense that the APA has already kind of by joining the Climate and Health Alliance has already actually clearly said that way that, yep, this is relevant to us. We want to be part mm -hmm. of this. I'm just wondering if that kind of is something that's known to the membership in general and whether we could like, this is very far away maybe, but whether we could expect that that would influence, you know, your, your survey in a way. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Thanks for the question, Philippe. Um, I guess, so, cause our quite our survey aim, so this research aim is to kind of collecting um, Australian physiotherapist views about like climate change if and that um that the, has a question that includes do you think climate change is happening now so they can feel free to express uh, their opinions about this um situation if they think climate change is not happening it's fine because we just want to collect in their views about that and we can an analyze our data like from their responses to see like how many percentage like in this stage, um, Australian physiotherapists think um, climate change is an issue and how many percent of them thinks it's okay, it's not happening. And then we can, yeah, have a like conclusion yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I'll just uh, relay here from Beth Phillips in the US. She has three doctoral students that are planning on similar project in California, but aimed at students prior to curriculum addressing climate change and PT role and then following up after, I guess, after uh, the education course. Uh, so that would be exciting. And uh, it's good to have, you know, different types of these studies in different parts of the world as well. Uh, and uh, then I'm wondering, Jess, would you just maybe like to unmute and just ask your question that way? Sure. So great presentation, Linia. Um, I was just interested to hear more about the questions you're actually asking about climate change. So I know that you had the demographic um, side of things in there, and I may have just missed it. Um, but how are you actually collecting those kind of perceptions and thoughts? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, we mainly like we use the ATS survey to from our base of our survey. So we just make really um, minor changes from the survey. So most of questions are from that survey tool and we just make some minor changes from that. And if you don't mind, do you want me to share the um, survey questions? Yeah, just briefly, I think, yeah. Yeah, that'd yeah. be good. Yeah, no worries, just a moment. So basically like uh, first question we ask, like, do you think climate change is happening? And um, asking them about like, um, like how much are you sure about like climate change is happening or not happening? Cause it depends on participants. If you think, uh, if they think it's not happening and how, like how sure are they about that? And also we also included about like their views about um, do you think uh, climate change is impacting your patient's health? And also do you think like um, um, uh, climate change is associated with your uh, practice? Yeah, so yeah. And also from the demographic things, um, so it's in the last few slides, if I share the slides 
second. So it's in the last few questions about the demographic questions. Yeah. Can you see? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it depends on, so we make it more um, suitable for our target audience. So um, we changed the, um, for example, for question 20, um, we changed the US state to like geographical area and change to Australian state, uh, in which Australian state do you do work. And also just for gender thing, we adding the non-binary one. Hmm. Um, okay, yeah. thanks, Linnea. Yeah, that's really good. A, a little bit and, of an, in, an insight. And sense. I think Beth also from the US is asking, I believe if your survey is publicly available or, some, or if the ATS survey is publicly available, I think what I'll make, uh, what I'll try and do is I'll send around contact information for all you presenting students today so that uh, everyone present and not present, you know, can can ask questions that, you know, people that are involved in the EPT agenda, they can just kind of get in touch with you uh, for yeah. follow ups. But uh, thank, thank you. you for that lovely presentation, Ninja. Uh, we'll have Thanks. to race on to the next one. Uh, uh, and that will be Isabel Cooksey from the University of Winchester who will presenting on uh, uh, also in some ways related a survey study, I think that's uh, in process about how musculoskeletal physiotherapists use and interact with environments during patient interactions. Izzy, over to you. Thank you, Philippe. Just share my screen. So welcome to my presentation. Um, as Philippe just said, I'm an undergraduate student studying physiotherapy at the University of Winchester in the UK at the moment. Um, as part of my undergraduate research dissertation, I'm conducting a online survey into how UK HCPC registered musculoskeletal physiotherapists use and interact with physical environments during patient actor uh, interactions. And as part of my recruitment for this, I'll be looking to disseminate my questionnaire out to Environmental Physio Association members. So just a bit about the background into my research. Um, typically, MSK physios use a standardised environment during patient interactions. And my research intends to understand the use of alternative environments that MSK physios use. Um, within this research, the, use, the term alternative environment will be used to explore the environments that are not traditionally used. This includes outdoor settings such as green space and natural environments, indoor settings, um, including large open spaces and gym environments and any other different environments that MSK physios use. Um, so at the moment, I have done my research proposal and I'm just starting out to um, collect responses within my questionnaire. Um, so within my proposal, I looked at literature regarding um, usefulness of outdoor of the outdoor environment within physiotherapy practice, um, exposure to green spaces and the impact it has on the burden of pain, as well as positive associated health outcomes, and uh, research in relation to a combined approach with indoor rehab in a urban green rehab um, context, as well as the barriers faced when trying to implement this. Um, other literature I looked at included using the home environment and the use of different types of spaces and rooms. So looking into the aims of my research, uh, my research hopes to look into the different environments that MSK physios use and understand the reason why they use these specific environments, as well as exploring the advantages and disadvantages to using these alternative settings. And the research questions that I'm looking to explore are what does the physical environment, uh, what role does the physical environment have during MSK physio interactions? And does this impact on the perceived quality of care? Um, to what extent do MSK physios use in alternative environments during patient interactions? Um, what are the perceived benefits and detriments to receiving care in these alternative environments? And to what extent do MSK physiotherapists feel that using these different environments influences patient outcomes, as well as what are the facilitators and barriers to using these alternative environments? Um, this research hopes to inform our understanding of the different environments used 
um, and the perceived impact that this has on the patient interactions, um, the quality of care, and this will allow for a greater understanding of the benefits and difficulties faced, um, and therefore this can help to inform future physiotherapy practice. So the design of my research, um, it will be a online questionnaire, which will be quantitative in design. Um, this will uh, collect open and closed questions and my sampling method will be non-probability. Um, and this will be used to collect a representative sample. Um, for this, I'm using gatekeepers. Um, and with this, I'm using a um, the ISP, ISCP pages, um, Physio First, um, which are UK based physio associations, and as well as obviously the Environmental Physio Association um, to disseminate my questionnaire out. Um, I will also be using social media to um, recruit participants. And from this, I hope that. Um, the participants will then reshare the questionnaire so that this can increase the engagement. Um, I'm hoping for a sample size of between 30 and 75. At the moment, I've had about 45 responses. Um, so it's going, going well so far. I think it, the questionnaire has only been out for a few weeks. Um, and with this, the inclusion criteria um, is HCPC registered MSK physiotherapists, um, including those with a MSK caseload in a clinical and community setting who are practicing in the United Kingdom and who use land-based environments. And with my exclusion criteria, this would be purely cardiorespiratory or neurological practicing physiotherapists um, and those that use um, water-based hydrotherapy interventions, as well as those who are not in the United Kingdom. Um, and this research has been approved according to the university ethics guidance. Um, so just looking at the results of what I have received so far, obviously this is just like preliminary results and I hope that over time we can get a bit more interest in it. Um, so looking at these results so far, 70% um, of the participants only have access to one environment, and this traditionally is um, what the standardised MSK environment would look like. Um, many define this as a small single room, and a smaller percentage define this as those alternative environments that we're looking at. Um, and these spaces that um, people state are commonly used for all patient interventions, so that's assessment, treatment, education, etc. Um, but having these rooms will facilitate privacy, um, but uh, physiotherapists find that this can be quite restrictive in the terms of intervention that they provide. And they found that the biggest bar barrier to um, using a alternative environment would be practicality and cost. Um, and people find that where they have only access to one primary environment, this does not necessarily affect um, the patient quality of care or the patient outcomes. Um, however, 26% of participants said that um, they do have access to at least one alternative environment. Um, as part of my questionnaire, I have found out like how many other alternative environments people have, but yeah, um, those with access to these alternative environments that this does improve patient compliance and physician patient relationships, as well as facilitating more advanced rehabilitation. Um, and most of these alternative environments are indoors. Um, this includes gym settings, communal spaces and patients' homes. It'll be interesting to see as we get more responses if any of these are green spaces or outdoor spaces. Um, and again, these alternative environments are commonly used for treatment and rehabilitation, not so much for assessment. Um, but interestingly, with these alternative environments, they also have their disadvantages, um, such as greater health and safety risks, um, temperature regulation, time constraints, and obviously these spaces can have an increased demand. Um, but similarly, in regard to the primary environment, there isn't a clear um, effect with the quality of care and patient outcomes. Um, so that's what I've got so far for my research. Obviously, I hope to gain more responses um, and gain more participants over the next few months. Um, and thank you for listening. Thank you for this opportunity and any questions. Thanks, Izzy. I find this 
so inspiring and encouraging to see. Uh, it's really great when you're working on. Can I just remind you to unshare your screen? And then we have two questions here, and we'll have to strictly limit it to those because we're not doing great with time. Um, I'll start with uh, Mila. Mila, do you want to just pose your questions? Unmute and yeah. Uh, yes, thank you for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if there are um, any structural conditions in the UK uh, in relation to therapy outdoors, and do you know whether you are allowed to take patients out of the practice and into nations um, insurance-wise? Um, so looking at the research and looking at the responses of games so far, it is available to take patient outdoors, um, but I think uh, obviously, as part of my research, I'm looking at the barriers of why people don't always do it. Um, and I think, as I say, a lot of that's practicality, weather conditions and just time constraints. So it's available, but I'm just interested to see what stops it. Thank you. And then, Rose, would you like to unmute briefly? Yes, I think I was um, heading down the same track as Mila. Thank you very much, Izzy. That was really interesting. And I thought maybe the pr practice principles might be thinking about risk management. So um, along the same lines as Mila. Thank you. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering. I think with these, like, if I have a question of my own, uh, these with these considerations about practicality and costs, it would be lovely to have, like, over time. And I'm not sure if you're going to get that, if you're planning that, to have quite detailed information on what really is sort of the other practicality issues you just mentioned, weather and something like that, and. Uh, I think that kind of going into detail there would be really interesting also. And I was also curious about what kind of alternative indoor environments we might be speaking about. Um, do you have anything on, on, on the latter? Um, so I think with that, where traditionally, um, I know in, in the United Kingdom, a MSK environment would just be a small room with a... Um, just a plinth in it where patient uh, where physios would work off um so the alternative indoor environments would be looking at those bigger open spaces clinic spaces gym environments where they've got the use of equipment or where potentially there is more exposure to light or like there is more to engage with within that environment yeah yeah cool but all still pretty kind of like uh yeah orthodox or traditional ish yeah. uh, physiotherapy environments Thank you. Thanks so much, Izzy. That was really, really uh, uh, impressive. Um, uh, we'll have to move us on to the next presentation, uh, which uh, is going to be given by Kian Ritzel. He's currently in Zurich in Switzerland, but he has done his bachelor, uh, if I'm not mistaken, at Saxion University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. And he will be presenting on a walking-based program to address the physical, mental, and social aspects of lower back pain uh, via a single case study. Kian, I hope you're there and hearing me. I'm there. Cool. Feel free to share your screen. I'll share my screen. Like share. Does it work? No, it doesn't work. All good. Doesn't work. Can I send it to you by? Sure. Yeah. Send it over. I should have sent it to you before. We're going to make quick. Yep. Like, there you go. Email sent. Let's see where it's going to come in. I'm wondering, Kian, is it okay if we maybe hop to Alexander first and then kind of come back to you when I have the That's okay. Here? That's all right. Yeah. That's all right. right. Yeah, yeah. Good. That's so right. we'll move on to uh, uh, Alex. Uh, Alex, I hope you're hearing me. Uh, uh, next, we'll just uh, kind of switch the order here a little bit for, for practicality's sake. Uh, Alexander Pop, uh, also from HFU Furtwang University in Germany, has a presentation for us on his study on the effects of climate crisis of the climate crisis on patients with COPD. Uh, Alex, if you're hearing me, uh, please give us a sign and then share. Yes, the I can hear you. Cool. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. 
So I hope you can see my presentation now. Yes, uh, yeah, perfect. Perfect. So um, yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to present my current research project. And um, yeah, so I'm working on my bachelor thesis right now. And the topic is the effects of the climate crisis on patients with COPD. And most importantly, uh, what can physiotherapists do about it? So first of all, I want to start with my personal relevance. And I thought about to best show it. I just show you this picture. On the bottom right, there's me with the black hat. And this is on a demonstration for climate and environmental protection with the um, yeah, organization called Health for Future, what Mila already talked a little, bit, a little about it. Um, yeah, and I think that quite good shows my interest in environmental activism and also environmental protection. And yes, so I'm really interested in connecting these two topics, health and climate change. And so I wanted to do this in my research project for my bachelor thesis as well. And also my goal was to achieve a broader knowledge on this topic and especially, especially on the topic of how um, the role of physiotherapy is in this in this field. Um, so I thought about it, and uh, first I didn't really know how, but um, luckily my um, lecturer, um, which I connected with, had some ideas on it. And after some back and forth, I decided to um, to choose the the field of respiratory systems and the effect of climate change on um, patients with respiratory system uh, with respiratory diseases so yeah i decided to my, um, do my bachelor thesis about climate change and copd um, a short reminder for you guys um, copd is called a chronic abstract obstructive pulmonary disease and it's character characterized by persistent respiratory symptoms and airflow limitations due to a loss in airway and alveolar function. And it's currently the third highest mortality rate worldwide and has all, also an increasing prevalence. So why I chose COPD is um, because patients with chronic pulmonary diseases are especially vulnerable on environmental impacts. And most important there are impacts like decreased air quality and heat stress, which are both um, directly linked to the climate crisis. So as an example, um, a study by Witt et al said that in heat waves, there's an excess mortality risk up to 43% for patients with COPD. And also there's an increasing risk of exacerbations on extreme heat events and also in areas with a high amount of air pollutants. So yeah, increasing risk of exacerbation also means for us, there are more and more COPD patients with acute exacerbations who are in need of physiotherapy. Yeah, so when I took a look on what is already available, I found out that there's already quite good evidence of effects of the climate crisis on health of patients with COPD. And there are already some overall suggestions and adaption on adaption and reducing the negative impacts. But what is missing right now is what role the physiotherapy can play here. Oh yeah, the role of physiotherapy. Um, so there oh, one moment. So the mitigation and adaption strategies are needed to reduce the negative impacts of climate change right now. And I thought about it and um, I split the adaption kind of in two separate categories. And the first is the adaption on the environmental factors. So this is when I talk about policies and human systems, adaption like green cities and public health strategies. And the second one is the adaption of the patient itself. And with that I mean um, strengthening the resilience and coping strategies so the patients can adapt to the environment, which is changing. Um, yeah, so this is where I think physiotherapy plays a role. So I see physiotherapists also as health advocates for advocating health and um, yeah, advocating about possible risk factors, which are also increased by climate change. 
and also i think um yeah physiotherapists also have a really special position to address impacts due to the therapist patient relation so all of this led to my research question which was um or which is how can physiotherapists influence the adaption of patients with copd in the context of a changing environment due to the climate crisis and since there was no evidence yet on this and to generate a hypothesis um, i decided to do guided expert interviews um, according to glaser and laudo and uh, i'm using qualitative research methods short thing about my methods um, Right now, I'm in the middle of um, conducting the interviews, and I decided to um, take two to four experts. And inclusion criteria are they should be physiotherapists who work in the field of respiratory therapy, and they should have a work-related or personal-related interest in the topic of climate change and health. So right now, I already, I already conducted two interviews, and so if someone feels like he or she fits in the inclusion criteria, um, feel free to contact me. But yeah, so there are probably two more to come. And the interview has a length of approximately 30 minutes. And after I conducted all interviews and did the transcription on it, I will do a qualitative content analysis according to Claire and Laudo as well. And the results will be interpreted interpreted and discussed with each other and in the context of the background. Yeah, okay, I sped up really. And so I'm already at my results. <laughs> um, yeah, so this was the place where I would present to you my results, but unfortunately I'm not there yet. So they will be coming soon. And um, as an example of what is to come, um, I wanted to show you one quote of an interview about how physiotherapists can reduce the exposure of environmental link risk factors. Um, I give you a moment to read it. All right, yes. So that's it for the moment. And, um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity and are there any questions? Thanks, Alex, for this presentation. I'm excited to see what uh, comes out of your study. Um, uh, Rose, I'm wondering if you could uh, pose your question by unmuting and also maybe explain a little bit more about what uh, specifically for us non-native speakers. Very much, Alex, I was interested in seeing you walking down the street with that banner. I mean, interested in your study as well, but I just wondered where you learnt your advocacy skills, because that's something that I think uh, we don't have any training in, or to my knowledge, in Australia. And uh, I think it looked great what you were doing, and I just wondered how you got yourself involved in that. Um, yes, um, it's quite a little story. So um, there is this organization here in Germany, which is called Health for Future, and uh, they participated in the demonstrations from Fridays for Future quite often. So yeah, I as I to participate in um, in a called Planetary Health Academy, they they taught me about this organization, and I went there, and it's kind of an an organization where uh, where there are um, health experts from many different so there are there are um, doctors there are nurses and so on and yeah I guess um, yeah I developed them there kind of <laughs> I don't know if this nice. answers the question yeah oh, thank you that's good interesting thank you and I think the frequent truth of my knowledge of Alex's and, for example, Mila's involvement also, it's more, it's, it's less a matter of training beforehand as much as uh, jumping in and then learning on the go uh, and yes. just kind of developing things on the go. Yeah. Uh, all right. Thanks, Alex. Uh, it's, thanks also for helping us with our time issues. Uh, it, uh, this will help us move on uh, as well. That was really lovely and uh, yeah, excited to hear of your results when you get there. Uh, Okay, we're moving on to Kian. I have the presentation here now. So Kian Ritzel has done his bachelor on the 
at the Saxon University of Applied Sciences on a walking based program to address the physical, mental and social aspects of lower back pain via a single case study. Kian, I'm seeing that you're trying to share your screen. There you go. That, that looks much better, but we're on the last slide at the moment. Yes. Yep. That looks all right. We can just leave it that way. Yep. yep. No, you had it there for a moment. That's good. Yep. Kian, you're already sharing your screen. That was it was fine just now. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to put the the mute the the mute thing off. <laughs> okay, good. Um let me go to the side. That's good. Okay. Cool. Um so I'm Kian Rizzo and I've done my study uh, at Saxon University of Applied Sciences. And we had to do an innovation project. And at first, I thought, OK, I'm going to work with a company. It's, it's got a technology company called Xsense. And they have um, little markers that you put on someone's body. And it allows you to basically put on 3D, uh, 3D movements. And at some point, uh, I was questioning this. Does it need to be an innovation? Does it mean to be technology? And then I looked at uh, actually the definition of innovation and discovered actually that innovation is about the spread of an innovation and not about doing something new or technologically new. So I kind of like rethought everything and i was like okay what is the single single thing that uh, we should be doing as as uh, humans and i was like well that's walking and i'm like why do we never walk <laughs> in our physiotherapy practices like for instance outside or yeah so that was the that was the starting point and i looked at research that um that was saying that basically walking can be used uh for treating low back pain you don't have a lot of a um, lot of them that actually say you can use walking for low back pain but they do say that it's actually as efficient as uh lumbar stabilization exercises or or other type of treatment so so i was like based on that i'm confident uh telling my patients uh, we can use walking uh, to treat your to treat your low back pain. Well, it, and then it's basically about selling it to the patient because well, the research says it's as useful as, for instance, stabilization exercises or manual therapy. Um, well, then I went to Ticino in Switzerland, where they speak Italian, and I tried to um, implement my research. But it didn't work out. Uh, most patients would uh, just uh, after a few sessions would of like exercise and and walking, they would just be like, "Hey, uh, can you just do me a massage?" <laughs> so, so I started to look at other things like, well, every time like a patient comes in um, the physiotherapy clinic, they have expectations, and. If you come with something new, it's kind of like, well, it's not what they expect, you know, and you, it's, it's kind of like a tacit contract between you, well, between the patient and you, you know, it's like, okay, you, you the patient comes and you do something for them, you know. And also there was a second aspect that was also really interesting is like the health insurances were not covering uh, the cost if there was a problem outside. So if we were walking outside, they would not cover the cost if there was an accident, which was, well, okay. So um, those two aspects, the expectations of the, the patients and then the health insurance aspects made the, um, the uh, implementation of the study quite hard. And then I went to Oslo, Norway for my second internship. And uh, there I was more confident as well. 
um, in implementing the study and we uh, did um, we looked for patients uh, on LinkedIn and WhatsApp and I, I found a, a few patients and well I'm going to tell you one patient so for instance he had low back pain and the whole uh, study was about basically changing his behavior and for instance he he would tell me yeah when I go upstairs I have pain in my back but if I do two stairs uh, if I do two stairs every time then I don't have pain so I'm like well then do two stairs every time and also a very interesting aspect was uh, the social anchor so uh, after a few weeks um, the patient had to come up with a goal uh, a, a sport goal or, or something an activity that he had to do with some some someone else or like a friend and i think that's that's a very important um aspect of that of that study is that basically you the patient um the patient implements the behavioral changes and also start to um invite his friends to do some some activities with him so i think that's also a really interesting so he be becomes basically a health health advocate in that moment um and also i think an inter interesting study if we talk about those cultural aspects is that in oslo there was an old lady um and she had her groceries and she wanted to go in the tram and i was trying to help her and she was like, no, 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 I have to do it. So I think that's also very interesting compared to um, the Italian part of Switzerland, where if the same would happen, she would have let me help her. So I think cultural aspect of uh, activity, physical activity in every day's, everyday activity are really important. And they basically shape the expectation of physiotherapy. And last internship was in the clinic Lang, so that was a neuro uh, neuro rehabilitation center. So um, a few days, uh, a few patients a day uh, were planned for the treadmill inside. And after some time, after like two three weeks, I was like, well, it's beautiful outside, <laughs> and when it comes to walking, I'm just I I don't. I feel like walking on a treadmill is kind of boring. So I would I would always give the patient the choice of, hey, do you want to go walk outside or do you want to walk on the treadmill? And actually what was interesting is that they would walk more. They would walk outside more um, because on the treadmill after like 10, 15 minutes, they were kind of bored. They were like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And when we were outside, well, we had like... Um, the view on the lake, on the mountains, uh, there were horses or flowers or stuff like that. So it made the walk basically more interesting and also more challenging because you have like going up and down and you have changes of, of uh, surfaces. And also I think what a very interesting thing is, well, if you're in the neuro uh, rehab center, you're there for like what, one month or two? you hardly go outside on your own because well you need to relearn how to walk again and i think going outside made them really really happy so i think mental aspect was was really interesting and yeah conclusion so i think the patient's expectations are are really important because you come and and you change basically those expectations. You're, they come with like uh, that little room, as uh, Easy said, and you're like, well, no, 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 we're going outside and we're doing something. So that basically, it, it doesn't create conflict, but I think it you have to change the expectations. And basically, if you have to change something, then, then uh, that takes time. <laughs> And also that also underlines the cultural aspect of physiotherapy and how it's done in different, even in the same country, how it's done in, in uh, how it's done differently. And also one of the cool thing about the study was that social anchor basically 
um, making the patient be a health advocate. And uh, for now, my current practice, I every time I can, uh, we have a little hill next to the clinic. And I try to go outside and do exercises outside. Is that walking or lunges or uh, balance or endurance training? And I'm pretty much the only one doing that, even if we are 15 physiotherapists. But I'm confident in in this because I know it has, well, it's probably more interesting for some patients. Not for all, all but for Sonia. So, yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you, Kian, for that presentation. I'll just, yeah, perfect. So we have uh, two questions. Anibal, would you like to unmute and just ask your question to Kian? Yes, thank you for your presentation. And uh, I was just uh, thinking if you already found a strategy to convince people to walk when they expect passive treatments. Well, that's the whole game. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole game. I, I think, as I said, you you have to be self confident in um, in telling your patient, okay, this is gonna help you, because they come with expectations, and also cultural aspects are really really hard because it's a whole society that's built like that, you know. So it's a it's a small game but that's why i think the social anchor is really interesting because that makes the patient a health advocate for uh, for his own health and for the health of the people around him so yeah that's the whole game it depends on the culture where you are and then if you manage to to change the expectation of a patient then, then that that's then you then you've won right yeah um, thanks, Kian. I'm just going to jump in with a with a small kind of question or, or th some thoughts of my own. So I was wondering, you said at the beginning that in the first place in Switzerland, uh, in the Italian speaking part of Switzerland, that health insurance were, would not be covering any accidents yeah. outside. And so that was a limitation sort of to your study. Uh, I, I, and then you said that in Norway, you felt kind of more confident to do something of the sort, uh, but but did you then find out that in Norway health insurances would cover this? That's kind of question number one. Question number two is: It seems you went back to Switzerland yeah. into a setting where patients were taken outside, and what changed from a health insurance perspective then? And do you know what the situation is in the Netherlands? And how come you're taking patients outside now while in Switzerland? Yeah, uh, and so. I just want to say that I don't think that's a, I'm not sure if that's a cultural problem as much as a kind of legislation problem that differs from nation to nation, may, maybe. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, on that part. Yeah. Um, so the first thing is, well, the Italian part or the German speaking part are the same country. Mm. So I think health insurance would not cover it as well here in Zurich. Yeah. But it's, accepted to do physiotherapy outside mm. and people understand that basically they have to get active and if they are active inside or outside it doesn't really matter but the entire part of switzerland they're kind of more traditional in their way of thinking i would say so the rules are the rules and you have to respect them so that's one thing and about norway i don't know i was in a private clinic so i think patient would pay for them by, by, by themselves and and it was not i i don't know actually i i just did what i wanted so <laughs> mm. and now in the clinic i'm working in i don't care i i just go outside and 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 if the health insurance asks me okay well what's the thing i'm like well life happens outside and you can do you can do balance exercises inside but they don't transfer to gravel or some things like that so mm. So I think it's uh, it's more a matter of like how confident I am in doing things outside and also how people are willing to respect the, the rules. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, yeah I, guess, I guess that one another kind of way to uh, mess with patients and physiotherapy expectations would be if you were to offer physiotherapy only outdoors. And you said that from the start that, hey, you know, I don't have a clinic, we're doing this outdoors. 
it's going to be difficult for people to imagine to lie down and get a passive treatment or something of the sort. But that's maybe a side note. Um, thank you, Kian, also for that presentation. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for your presentations today. I'm sorry, I will, uh, with the comments and questions that just came into the chat, I'll, I'll have to cut us short here a little bit just for time. Um, I think this was really lovely for me. I, I really just want to emphasize again that I think that there's a huge potential in student research as a kind of element of, um, uh, of uh, yeah, uh, environmental physiotherapy education, but also um, ultimately the development of environmental physiotherapy as a field as we come to understand it and come to explore it. I know that, you know, on that note, I know that Mila is working on a publication uh, of her research that's probably going to include one or two other articles that will be analyzed as well. Uh, I'm most certain that Linya's research will be published. Uh, I, I'm also uh, I think similar things about Izzy's work and Kian has already prepared a blog post that will be, you know, at least a, a kind of EPA blog post that will come out uh, soon-ish. Uh, and uh, with Alex's work, we'll just see when it comes. But all of these, you know, beyond just being student research are really valuable contributions to, you know, our growing understanding and engagement in this field. And I really want to thank you for that. I think you're, you're, you are all already uh, pioneers and legends at the same time in the field of environmental physiotherapy. So uh, thank you for leading the way. And um, for everyone, uh, yourselves and everyone else included, we have a second session uh, with a few more speakers later this European afternoon. And uh, please do come back if you want to, and uh, we'll continue this conversation. Thank you.